Um, hi everyone, my name is Nicole Sudiaco and I'm the Member Services Manager at Global Skin and we'll be supporting the moderation of today's workshop about digital advocacy, uh, which will be facilitated by Jack Grimmel, co-founder and strategy director of Principles. So Jack is, uh, Jack, Zach is joining us today to explore the world of digital advocacy. In this session, we'll take a look at the various elements such as defining what digital advocacy is, how to define your goals and tactics and more. And these are all really vital skills that we are needing as we advocate for our disease areas, our disease communities, and, and work to influence either public policy or garner general support. And participants will have the chance to think and um, really brainstorm and share ideas during the Ask Me Anything portion later on. And uh, the goal of each workshop is to really ensure that you all as participants are able to walk, walk away with tangible ideas that benefit your needs. And before I introduce Zach and let him take it away, I'd like to go over just a few of the logistical items. So this is a workshop format and that will really encourage active participation um, from those in attendance. So if you could please share your name, your organization, and where in the world you are joining us today in the chat box below, that would be awesome. Uh, number two, we will be recording this session and you'll receive the recording um, after in about a week or so. And number three, today's session will be about an hour long with um, the presentation portion being about 30 to 40 minutes. And then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for the ask me anything portion at the end. So if you have any questions, please keep them in mind as Zach is presenting. Um, and then you can share them in the chat box below and we'll be sure to get to them at the very end after the presentation. And if you're inclined to, please feel free to uh, unmute yourselves and turn on your screens at the end uh, when asking your questions. Um, I'd like to now introduce our speaker during this event. So Zach Zimmel is the co-founder and strategy director at Principles, which is a Toronto-based firm that partners with charities and nonprofits um, and social impact focused groups to build creative campaigns, communication strategies, and branding projects to drive positive change in the world. Um, and as strategic lead, Zach works with Principles clients to identify business problems and solutions and to unearth audience or market insights and to build ambitious ambitious campaign growth plans. He moonlights as a copywriter, which he loves, and Zach is particularly nerdy about fundraising and audience growth strategy, digital advocacy, and data analysis. He doesn't fancy himself much of an optimist these days, but Zach finds hope when he thinks about people-powered um, social movements, which are harnessing technology for social good. So without further ado, Zach, I will let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you for reading that long bio. <laughs> um, I'll speak a little bit more about who I am and who Principles is um, in a moment. I will also just click a few buttons, so bear with me for a moment while I share my screen, and then we'll get going. All right. So we should be good to go. All right, so we have an hour ahead of us, actually 55 minutes. So uh, thank you firstly for joining. I've been watching in the chat, seeing where everybody is uh, is joining from. Um, and it looks like we've got a truly global audience today. So I'm very excited to walk you through something that I think about all of the time. And we have 55 minutes, even less of that will be me presenting. I could present on this for a week. Um, so this will be a fairly high level overview of um, digital advocacy campaigning. You will see that there is an ask me anything session at the end, as Nicole has indicated, um, where I'll be able to answer some of your questions on the spot. Um, and you'll also notice that I've put my email address on a few of the slides. If for whatever reason you have a question afterwards, I'd be happy to connect and, uh, and kind of chat through some of the content, but essentially, in the next 50 minutes, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about who I am and who Principles is. I'd like to make sure we are on the same page with regards to the definition of digital advocacy. And then I'd like to walk through th some of the steps that I like to go through when I'm deciding what my digital advocacy campaign or what my client's digital advocacy campaign needs to look like. So we'll talk a little bit about goals and tactics how we decide on our call to action, the things we need to think about before we actually develop some of the campaign materials. I'd like to have a conversation around measuring success. 
Then I'll just remind us about everything we talked about and answer some questions. So I'll start by talking a little bit about principles. Um, like Nicole mentioned, we are Toronto based. We're a communications firm that works only with nonprofits and social impact focused organizations. Uh, we do big campaign work. Um, so that might be a big digital advocacy campaign. It might be a fundraising campaign. Um, sometimes organizations come to us and say, we have a really small audience and we need help making that audience bigger. Sometimes it is, we have a big advocacy strategy and we don't know how to use the internet to help us meet our goals. Whatever they are, if it is a nonprofit organization that needs our help and it's a good fit, we're on board. Before principles, um, actually my entire life I've been working or focused on nonprofit um, organization work. I started not as a marketer, communicator, um, technically, I started in the um, community development and health promotion space, specifically focused around work in the uh, HIV AIDS movement um, and in the LGBTQ plus uh, communities in, uh, in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Um, that slowly shifted to a career in communications when I realized that all of these things kind of intersect. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I, we work with organizations of all, of all types, but my heart is really in kind of the intersections of uh, health equity, health advocacy, and digital campaigning. And so I'm very excited to be uh, speaking today on that topic. Uh, we work with organizations from all different types of verticals. So that might be international development, animal welfare, healthcare, human rights, um, we've worked with, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of different organizations, and we've had the pleasure of working with Global Skin for a few years now. Um, so we've been behind some of the projects that you may have seen, including um, the creation of a short film, uh, documentary film called um, Skin, Our Barrier to the World, and the creation of a digital advocacy campaign toolkit. So this toolkit is available on the Global Skin website uh, it is also going to be kind of the skeleton or the bones of what we will be, what I'll be walking you through today. So um, Nicole will either now or towards the end, share a link to where you might be able to find this on the website. Um, and it has more detail than what I'll be able to speak to in a half hour, but uh, a lot of the content um, you'll kind of, will be able to explore today. So let's get into it. Before we start talking about digital advocacy, I wanna make sure that we are talking about advocacy the same way. Um, lots of words can have so many different definitions and I want to make sure that today we are on the same page. So for today, we are going to define advocacy as any effort to compel a decision maker. And so a decision maker can be anybody in a position of influence. It might be a government official, it might be um, a board of directors. Uh, it could be really anybody, but a decision maker is somebody who um, is in a position of influence and advocacy is work that is designed to compel that decision maker to take some sort of action, whether that is to make a declaration, to create a policy um, and to take that action to get advocacy is to get them to take that action by leveraging support from our community and the broader public. So many strategies and tactics from government relations plans to public education campaigns to policy writing initiatives are all part of an advocacy program. And digital advocacy, I like to define or think of as essentially doing that work using the internet. Um, so digital advocacy has um, kind of, I guess, at one point started as um, a slice of the advocacy pie. And that slice has gotten bigger and bigger as the years have gone by. And in an increasingly digital world, I think the line between what is digital advocacy and what is advocacy, I think those two categories are starting to really blend together. But for the purposes of today, I want us to think about our advocacy programs as being big, um, as being kind of anything designed to help compel a decision maker to um, change their behavior or to act. And today we'll specifically be talking about the digital campaign portion of those advocacy programs. So grassroots versus grass tops. 
before we get into anything, I wanted to talk about this definition or these definitions. Um, this isn't necessary. This isn't actually in the toolkit, but I think uh, it's important for us to think about uh, think about this. All advocacy work requires a diversity of tactics um, in order for us to achieve our goal. And we can sometimes think about advocacy programs as being divided into grassroots initiatives and grass tops initiatives. So grass tops initiatives is some of the more traditional advocacy work that uh, involves maybe one to one human relationships, working with lobbying groups, um, potentially working with uh, and nurturing relationships with government officials um, between people. Grassroots initiatives are um, those big campaign moments. I like to think about grassroots initiatives as our people powered work. How do we mobilize our big audiences in order to help us achieve what we're doing in our grass tops work? So these two uh, intersect. They're not always defined. They're not always perfectly um, delineated, but they're both very, very important. And I just wanted to name that I don't believe any one tactic or any one campaign is necessarily the only answer to achieving your advocacy goals. And often we need a combination of grass tops and grassroots efforts in order to achieve our goals. For today, we're mostly going to be talking about grassroots campaigns and how we can build grassroots campaigns online to achieve our overall business objectives and advocacy goals. So I think it's time we jump right into it. We've kind of defined a little bit what is digital advocacy. We've talked a little bit about kind of the components that we need to be thinking about when we're um, kind of thinking theoretically about digital advocacy. And now we're sitting in a position where we say, okay, I understand what advocacy is. I understand what digital advocacy is. I understand what a grassroots campaign can be. And I think I need to run one. So now it's time to really start and ask yourself some questions before we um, before we run forward into actually developing our campaign. And this is often my job as a strategist. Sometimes organizations will come uh, forward and say, we want to run a big online petition and we want to launch in two weeks. Um, and it's often my job to say, okay, let's stop for a moment. Let's back up and let's talk about our goals. Let's talk about all of the components at once um, beforehand so we can create a plan holistically that will help us achieve our goals most efficiently. So some of the first questions I like to ask is, why are we doing this work? What is our main goal? And this is our main goal for our digital advocacy campaign. So we likely as an organization have many goals. We likely as an advocacy, as an organization with an advocacy strategy have multiple advocacy goals. But for this specific campaign, ask yourself, if we could only achieve one thing, what would that be? Of course, we want to achieve many things, but it's very important for us to align on a singular goal for our campaign before we proceed. And then everything else will be a nice to have. But ask yourself, if we could only achieve one thing and it is achieved, will, will we be happy? What is that one thing that we need to do in order to say our work has been successful? Once we know what that is, and this could be we want to speed up an approval process or we want to um, make a treatment program more accessible or affordable. Once we decide what that main goal is, then we should ask ourselves, who is our advocacy target? So who is that person in a position of influence or power that we need to make a decision? Who is the person that can decide, okay, we will make that treatment plan more affordable or we will make it more accessible. Um, once we understand what our main goal is, it's easier for us to decide who our advocacy target is. So now we've thought, okay, we know what our goal is. We know who our advocacy target is. Now we need to decide who is our campaign audience. And our campaign audience is essentially the big, we're talking about people powered campaigns. These are the people. So what are or who is in the large groups of people that we can activate in order to make our campaign successful? This is often people that we already have access to. So this could be a patient community that is already connected to you as an organization or it could be people we're not connected to, but who really care about that main goal. 
So if our main goal is to make a certain treatment more affordable, think about the people who are currently impacted by it being unaffordable. These people might be part of your campaign audience. And finally, we need to think about what action or commitment we want our advocacy target to take. So perhaps it is uh, the Minister of Health that we've decided is our advocacy target, the Minister of Health at a government. Um, we might say that we know our main goal is to make, just to use the same example, a treatment option more affordable. The action is we want our Minister of Health to sign a, write a policy or, or um, make some sort of tangible decision that we can point to and say, if you make this decision, our goal will be achieved. So really we want to think about what is our main goal? Who is our target? Who's the audience that we can activate in order to put pressure on our target? And what is the one thing we want that target to do? Once we know what those things are, we've got kind of the framework for our campaign. We have those main puzzle pieces and one thing is missing and that is what are we asking our audience to do? So we know that we want to apply pressure on our advocacy target. And there are many different calls to action um, that we can put in front of our big group of audience members and say, can you all together take this one action that will help apply pressure on our advocacy target? That one action we like to call our call to action. So this is the singular action that your audience will take in order to compel your advocacy target to take action. And I want to pause right now and just name. I know I'm using a lot of kind of buzzwords or um, what could even be feel like jargon. Towards the end of the presentation, we are going to regroup on all of these and provide really kind of simple definitions for each. Um, because it might be hard to kind of remember all of these, these different piece, pieces um, if it's the first time you're hearing some of them. But generally, our call to action is the one thing that we're asking our audience to do that will help put some pressure on our advocacy target. And you'll see on the next page, there are many calls to action that we can choose from um, that are very effective in a digital advocacy campaign. And there's no, um, there's often many good options. And so Sometimes what I like to do with clients is once we've answered all of the questions on the previous page, I like to say, let's pick our favorites. Which ones feel in our gut like they are the right calls to action? And then let's narrow it down by asking ourselves these three questions. Which tactic of our shortlist is our audience most likely to take? So some might be easier, um, for some might have a lower barrier to actually take the action. Um, we also want to ask ourselves which action, which call to action feels like it will apply the right type of influence or pressure on our advocacy target. And finally, which tactic do we actually have the capacity and resources to pull off? This third one is so important for any work that we're doing, especially working in the nonprofit uh, sector. We almost always have too much to do. We almost always don't have enough budget, we're wearing too many hats, we don't have enough time. And so we need to ask ourselves, how do we most efficiently get this work done? And which strategy do we actually have the capacity to pull off well? There are many, many good strategies that look good on paper. And then when you go to do them, you realize you don't have enough people, you don't have enough time, you don't have enough resources. So I always like to pause and say, what do we actually have the human and technical resources and capacity to pull off? And once you ask those questions, this next list becomes a little bit shorter. So some of the calls to action, and I'll explore a few op uh, examples in a moment, but some, exam some, some uh, calls to action that you might consider asking your community to take are to sign an e-petition, to add their name to an open letter, to write a letter to the editor in a local newspaper or media outlet that is in their community. For these first three, we are often writing the petition in advance and asking people, do you agree, sign your name. 
for the open letter, we're also writing that letter in advance and, and saying rather than to sign this petition, which will later be delivered to the government, an open letter is available for everybody. And we're just basically trying to get as many people or organizations to sign on to our open letter um, to add credibility and show this is how many people and organizations stand behind this position statement. Our letter to the editor, we're often helping our, our community by giving them key points that they might want to write about um, in, when they write a letter to the editor asking for, um, for a government, for example, to make a treatment plan more accessible. I'll just keep using that same example. Other calls to action include a hand raiser. And a hand raiser is really similar to an e-petition, but an e-petition tends to be a little bit more specific. It might say, here's a three-point plan that we want you to, uh, you, our advocacy target to action or to roll out. Whereas a hand raiser is much more broad. And it might be something like, add your name if you agree. If you agree, every person deserves care. And then we're just asking as many people as possible to raise their hand and say, I agree. Some more uh, higher barrier or um, more uh, involved calls to action might include an online training. So rather than let's put a big petition together, we're saying, hey, community, we are going to host a webinar just like this one, where we will teach you how to go have conversations with decision makers in your community. This is a very effective form of online advocacy. And so it's important to remember um, that online or digital advocacy campaigns don't necessarily always need to be about big petition type moments. It might be about recruiting 20 people from your community who can learn online how to move forward offline, for example, to help you achieve your goals. An invitation spree is a fun call to action that I've seen some organizations use. And this might be um, that a nonprofit is um, hosting a uh, conference and the conference is designed for decision makers to teach them how to be better. But we can't get a lot of decision makers to sign up. And so we ask our community to send hundreds and hundreds of RSVPs to as many decision makers as possible to help us fill seats. A tweet storm is when we try to get a specific message trending on Twitter. And so we might reach out to our community and say, next Tuesday at 10 a.m., we want as many people as possible to use this specific hashtag so that we can show how big and powerful our movement is. Um, we help our community and remind our community to be online at the same time engaging with the same hashtag. And story amplification, uh, I've seen in two different ways. We know, and uh, likely most people here know, that when you're able to tell a story about a real person who's impacted by your work, it's a lot easier for people to emotionally connect to, um, to the issue. And so we've seen digital uh, advocacy campaigns that are designed at getting people to share their stories. Um, or we've seen digital campaigns where an organization might share a story and ask for as many people as possible to help share it. So those are examples of calls to action um, that you might consider. And after you've figured out, just to back us up a little bit, what the goal is for your campaign, who your advocacy target is, who your audience is, um, it will help you refine this list into a much shorter list. Um, and so, for example, to use kind of that same scenario where we're trying to get a, a treatment plan to be more affordable and we're asking a policymaker or a decision maker to make a policy that will make it more affordable. We might say our audience, now that we think about it, is actually all of the mothers of, of patients who are affected. And we might consider also what our capacity is internally, both from a human and technical standpoint. Then we come to a list like this and we say, okay, what, we, what do we know about that group of mothers? What do we know about our online abilities to put an e-petition together versus a tweet storm? And then we might say, okay, based on what we know, an e-petition or a letter to the editor right now feels like we don't have enough capacity internally to draft something really complicated. 
but we do have enough capacity to put a hand raiser statement together. And we think that mothers of patients would, based on what we know about them, would really respond to a hand raiser. And so if that is the case, you can then start to um, make your short list even shorter and, and help decide what call to action you want to move forward with, with your campaign. And one thing that I want to name right now is that it always, there are all, we need to achieve so much. There's so much change in the world that we want to see. And so we are always going to want to do more than one of these things or reach out to more than one audience or more than one advocacy target. But I have learned over the years that the more focused we can be with a campaign like this, the more we can say we only have one issue, one advocacy target, one audience, one call to action, the more likely we will be successful because we're not diluting our efforts. And so it is very important that you don't proceed with all of these um, and that you think of a very focused campaign. I'd like to give you a few examples that we've worked on in the past six months. This first one is just a just an image, but um, one of the organizations we work with is Planned Parenthood Toronto. And just a few months, uh, just at the end of 2019, Toronto had a municipal election um, and a new city council was being voted on. So before the election, Planned Parenthood Toronto put together a campaign um, that uh, reached out to a certain audience in Toronto and asked individuals to sign a petition that would send a letter directly to all of the people who were running for city council saying, we demand a plan. Can you please let us know what your plan is so we can decide if we should vote for you? This was a way to apply pressure on candidates running for city council beforehand and ask them to make a plan so that the community could decide what made the most sense for them when, it, when election time came around. Now, another organization we work with is YWCA Toronto. And we also did some work around, uh, we and they did quite a bit of work around that same election. So before the election, YWCA Toronto worked with a collection of other nonprofits who were interested in addressing the housing crisis in Toronto. And they put together an open letter. And this was an open letter to all Toronto mayoral and council candidates expressing why this is such an important issue. And then they circulated this letter with a survey to all of the organizations they could think of before this campaign launched and said, do you agree with this open letter? Would you be okay putting your name at the bottom of it? And so on launch day of this open letter, YWCA went out to the community and said, look, we already have 50 organizations who've signed on to this open letter. Once the election was over and the new city council was in place, one week later, we were ready with a new campaign that said, hey, welcome, welcome aboard new city council. We have some demands and we sent them a petition as well. So this is a good example of how you might leverage a moment in your community like an election. Um, and really think about kind of one campaign before, one campaign after. These are campaigns that are both focused on solving similar problems related to the housing crisis, but rather than do an open letter and a petition at the same time, we thought about how these might be two separate campaigns that are singular in their focus so that we're not diluting our efforts. And the last example I'd like to share today is one that we worked on uh, just at the end of 2019 again with Parkinson Canada. And this was a similar campaign. We were asking or they were asking people to sign a petition that was asking the federal government to increase funding for, um, for health-related stuff. <laughs> and um, we ran a campaign that sent as many people from the target audience to this petition page and asked them to fill it out um, and add their name. One thing that was a little bit different that this organization did prior to launching was reach out to their community and get individuals to record short videos. Um, we were able to provide some talking points to these community members, but these are individuals who are living with Parkinson's disease who are explaining via video in 30 seconds why it is so important that somebody sign this petition. So everything was focused on that call to action to sign the petition. 
Um, and getting uh, kind of stories in advance, we were able to amplify these individual stories. Here you see Caroline and Nathan, um, and they were able to explain from their perspective why this campaign was so important. Um, the other thing I'd like to say about this campaign is it wasn't just a digital campaign. This was our grassroots campaign. At the same time, Parkinson Canada has an advocacy team that was focused on a grass tops strategy. That strategy was also focused on increasing the same funding. Um, and we actually just found out last month that uh, it was successful and the federal government has actually agreed um, to increase that specific funding by I think $46 billion over the course of the next 10 years. So this digital campaign did not alone achieve that, but we did find out that the ability for our advocacy team focusing on the grass tops work to say, in addition to everything we've been talking about, um, thousands and thousands of Canadians have signed this petition. That helped that, that grassroots work and those results really helped the grass tops team um, prove the credibility and momentum that, uh, that Canadians were demanding this change uh, and played a big part in, um, in moving that work forward. So we've talked about goals, we've talked about tactics, we've talked about our call to action. So right now we're probably thinking, we know who our audience is, we know who we want to get our campaign in front of, we know what the actual campaign is going to um, ask individuals to do. Now it's time to get to work. Now we need to create the campaign and our campaign materials. I want to name right now, it is so important to think about your entire strategy before you even begin to develop your first creative. And creative might be an email, might be an ad, might be a social media post. It's probably a little bit of all of that. But, but before we get started, you will save so much time, effort, energy and resources if you finish the strategy first and you think about the entire plan and everything that needs to be created before you get started. For example, you might say that you need to, your strategy might dictate that you need to go to your community and ask for those short videos. If you do that first and then later realize that you should actually ask those community members for a testimonial as well, you now have to go back to the community to the same people and ask again. If you think about everything that's required first, you will save time and effort. And in order to think about everything that's required, I like to say, let's map out the audience journey. And so an, an audience journey is essentially every single thing that our audience will do and see as they go from the beginning of the campaign to the end of the campaign. So in my example before, where I talked about the mothers of patients, pretend you are a mother of a patient. Where is the first place that you will hear about this campaign? Is it on social media? Is it on the radio? If it's on social media, okay, now we know there's a social media post that needs to be created. If it's on the radio, we need a radio spot. Where might they see our campaign? If they click on our social media post, where do they go? Okay, so now we know we have a social media post and they have to go to a website. We need to create a website or perhaps they go to a blog post. Okay, we need to write the blog post. If somebody gets to the page, let's say it's a petition, and then they take the action, what do we, what, firstly, what is the action? So we need to create the petition, but then what happens after they take the action? Is there a thank you page? Do we want to send them an email saying thank you? How are we planning on following up with them? Really map out by asking yourself on what days, in which channels, what are people clicking on? Where do they go when they click? Map out that whole journey. And when you have that journey mapped out, you can then look and say, which assets, which individual pieces of creative do we need to make in order to pull this off? Um, so once your entire journey is mapped out, you can then look at the journey and say, what assets are required? Make that comprehensive asset list. And at that point, you're ready to start developing your creative. All right, I know we're moving pretty fast, um, but that is because I wanted to save some time for an ask me anything question and answer session. And we're just a few minutes away from that. The last thing I did want to speak about is measuring success. This is so important to think about before you move forward with your campaign. I can't tell you how many times I have seen organizations run a campaign that I'm watching from the outside, 
um, that looks incredibly successful. I might be talking to a client at that organization. They're excited. They feel it's very successful. The campaign's over. They go tell their boss how successful it was. They say, wow, we got a thousand signatures. And their boss says, only a thousand? We needed 10,000. If it's not 10,000, I don't think it's, it's successful. It's so important to decide what success looks like before you get going. Otherwise, you might be celebrating something that not everybody feels is a success or vice versa. So really have a conversation around what does a best case scenario for this work look like? What is our stretch goal? Um, what is our, our kind of conservative, we'd be okay with this number, but we wish it would be better. Um, and what is a number that feels like a failure? It's important to really map that out before you proceed with your campaign to make sure that you're 100% on the same page. And so just like I mentioned on the very first slide about goals, if your campaign could only achieve one thing, what would that be? It might be to get a thousand signatures. It might be to send a hundred RSVPs. It might be to get five people to write a letter to the editor. Whatever that is, decide what it what what your what that goal is and consider that your primary business objective you should only have one primary business objective you might want to achieve many other things and if you do awesome but what is the single thing that if you achieve it you are successful name it and then also make sure that you have the ability to track it um, <laughs> this also happens a lot um, where organizations halfway through a campaign realize they can't actually count how many people are clicking on their petition because they didn't set it up the right way. So really figure out what is the measurement strategy? What is our plan to track towards our goal? And once you define what your goal is, share it. Share it loudly. Be transparent. People want to be a part of the movement. And so if you tell them what the goal is, they will very excitedly help you get there. And report on momentum, not just final results. People like to be a part of winning teams. They want to help you win. If halfway through the campaign, you say, we're 50% of the way there, we know you've already signed the petition, but we need your help reaching out to your friends and family so we can actually meet our goal, that will help people, uh, that will inspire people to act and you will see more results. Don't wait until the end to report on the momentum of your campaign. And also optimize as you go. Because you're tracking all of your numbers as you go, you might notice that some things are working and other things are not. Do not be afraid to change things while you're in market. Don't change your objective. Don't change your audience. But you might realize that the way you're wording something hasn't really been working or hasn't been resonating with your audience. And so one of the beauties of working in digital is you can change things. It's not, you haven't printed out a billboard and now you're stuck with that billboard. Often you can just go online and change a word or two. Um, and so don't be afraid to optimize and improve things as you go, but make sure that those optimizations are based in the data. And then finally, use your online results for offline impact. So report back to the whole community and say, Wow, we achieved our goal. Thank you. A thousand people signed that, that petition. But also, there are opportunities to do things like create a brochure or a one pager that says, in the month of January, we hosted a petition and a thousand people signed it. You might create that brochure and leave it behind in an in-person meeting that you have with a government official, for example. We can really think about the ways that we might blur digital and online with offline efforts um, because they don't necessarily and will increasingly as time goes by, they won't necessarily always be different realms. And so think about the ways that your online results can be reported or leveraged or used offline. So we've got about 20 minutes left. I'm going to walk us through two pages that will recap and redefine some of the words that I've used. And then uh, we'll pass the mic over to you folks and I'd love to answer some questions. So as a reminder, when you're deciding 
how to put a digital advocacy or your next digital advocacy campaign together. Start by determining your main goal. Your main goal is the one thing that needs to happen in the world for you to say, this was a success. An example of that might be make a specific treatment affordable. Once you know your main goal, pick your advocacy target. And as a reminder, this is the person or the people, and these are usually people with influence, whose behavior you want to influence. So we want to get the mayor to make a declaration. Our advocacy target would be the mayor, or it's written here, the minister of health. You need to decide who your campaign audience is. These are the people who, these are, this is in the people powered campaign, these are the people. The example I've used throughout is the mothers of patients. It might be the entire patient community. It might be teachers. Really think about who your campaign audience is and always know that the, you already have an audience and there you're most likely to say yes when you ask them to do things because they're already connected to you. So always think about them as part of your audience or as a starting point when defining who your campaign audience is and then expand or hone in on a certain portion of that audience. Um, also, just remember that all campaigns can't be for all people. Um, we don't want to isolate um, or exclude certain audiences. But when we're designing our campaign, we want to think of our primary audience. So name that, and that will be your campaign audience. Next. Prescribe the action you need your advocacy target to take. So this is that tangible thing that your advocacy target is, that you're demanding of your advocacy target. So for example, can you, we demand that you present a plan for increased healthcare funding. Now we know we have our goal, our advocacy target, our campaign audience, and the action we want our advocacy target to take. The next one is our call to action. Our call to action, uh, <laughs> not sure where that sentence went, but our call to action is the individual action that we're asking that audience to take to apply pressure on our advocacy target. So that might be the e-petition, the letter to the editor, um, the tweet storm, determine what that is. And once you have all of those things defined, you can now map out your audience journey. And your audience journey is the list of every interaction your audience will have with your campaign from the beginning until the end. For each interaction, you want to define both the date and the channel, as well as the next steps the person will take if they engage with the campaign. So if they click on the ad, where do they go? What happens next? Map that whole journey out and then develop your asset list. Your asset list is a list of everything you need to create. Once you've got that sorted, um, ensure that your measurement strategy is in place. Think of all of the numbers you are going to want to count and make sure you have a plan to count them before you launch. Then it's time to launch. And then remember, don't wait until your campaign is over to report on your results. Your audience will appreciate your transparency and they want to help you win. So that was a lot of information. In about 40, 30 minutes, we've got 15 minutes remaining and I'd be happy to answer any questions that individuals have. Um, also, we might not be able to get to every question. So if you do have others and you'd like to um, discuss further or if you have something you'd like me to clarify, I'm happy to, to respond to a few emails and this is my contact information on the screen. But in the meantime, um, I believe Nicole's going to help uh, field some questions. Thanks, Zach. Thank you so much for an awesome presentation. Jam-packed with information, but super useful resources and um, really relevant um, information for our patient organization leaders. So again, the floor is open for everyone to ask questions. Um, and I actually, I also have a question for our patient organization leaders, and that is, where are you at with your journey in patient and digital advocacy yourself? So I know that some of you folks have had really successful digital advocacy campaigns, um, or maybe you have questions for other patient leaders or for Zach about um, some of their successes. So the floor is open and please feel free to turn on your cameras and um, unmute yourselves as well. I think maybe we have a shy group today. 
<laughs> Usually they're not so shy. And that's all right as well. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Oh, I'll ask you to unmute. There you go. Hi, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what I did now. I can't see you guys. Okay. Um, so my name's Emily. I, I work for Mia Thrives. Um, we're a Canadian nonprofit that supports the emotional needs of children um, in Canada living with epidermolysis bullosa. So we've done a few online like awareness campaigns. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of them feel like they've been really successful. And then some of them have been like total flops. And <laughs> to be honest, like sometimes I'm just trying to figure out like, why did that one do so well? And that one didn't. So like often our awareness campaigns are like, for a quick example, we did a campaign that was called Love Mia's Gloves because that organization was founded after Mia. Um, a little girl with EB and um, she wears gloves every day because of her skin condition. So we put out this call to have people show Mia that she wasn't alone and to take pictures in these gloves and use the hashtag love me as gloves. And that campaign did so well. We did like, we had like hundreds of people who posted pictures and used the hashtag. And then we've done like kind of a similar idea with the hashtag and had like only five people post. So sometimes I'm just trying to figure out like, wow, why did like on social media, it seems to be so random and some things kind of trend and don't, but sometimes I'm kind of just trying to like figure out what I did differently or why certain campaigns did so much better than others. Do you happen to have any like insight into that? Yeah, so this is a problem that I'm often presented with. Um, so an organization will approach us with a scenario just like yours and say, we want to do this again, but sometimes it's been successful and sometimes it hasn't. The answers are different every time with regards to why it maybe was or wasn't successful. But some of the things that I like to think about as I go through the data to try and, and kind of determine what those indicators were, one of them is... Um, is really just media targeting, media planning and channel strategy. So what I mean by that is, um, are you sharing this on Twitter versus Facebook versus Instagram, et cetera? And is that the right channel for your audience? In addition to that, it's important to think about on, that, those, in, on those channels that you picked, um, are there other campaigns that your same audience might be seeing at the same time? So it might be that had you launched a month later, there would be less competition in that market. Um, and that the time you launched just happened to be when that audience was also being uh, you know, presented with many other asks. So that's something to think about. Another thing to note that has changed a lot, especially in the last few years, if you're thinking about social media campaigns, is at one point we were able to post on social media and our audience would just see it. This is no longer the case. Um, algorithms have changed. I'm sure we've all heard about the social media algorithms and it's kind of a pay to play market now. And so often if you're, if you have a thousand followers and you just post on social media with an ask, unless you're putting even a little bit of budget behind those posts, like maybe boosting a Facebook post, only five to 10% of people will ever even see it. And so really thinking about how, um, you know, your media planning might really make sure that your, your ask or your call to action gets in front of people. And then the last thing that I might think about is, um, is just how high of a barrier ask your, your, your call to action is. Um, so often, um, I'm happy to hear that your kind of share an image with gloves worked. Um, often that is too high barrier of an ask for individuals. So I, we will, you know, have clients come to us and say, we asked everybody to share a video and nobody did. People are private. That might be, have been, you know, a too high of a barrier. Whereas asking them to share a post or sign a hand raiser might've been a better um, barrier, uh, lower barrier ask. So I like to think about those things. Um, was it the right channel for my audience? Was there other competition in market? Um, are we designing this, you know, in, is the algorithm working with us or against us? Do we have some media spend behind it? Um, 
And then finally, was this a low enough barrier ask? But there are lots of lots of questions. And to be honest, sometimes it can just feel a little bit like the Wild West. It's different every time. Um, and that's why I often say with digital campaigns, it's good to be able to optimize once you're in market. We do all of this planning and discovery and research. And then launch day is like day one of discovery all over again. Once the numbers are coming in, look at what's working and do more of that look at what isn't and and try to optimize that. So I hope that answers your question. I know it's kind of, it's a big answer, um, but those are some of the first things I would think about. Great, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Thanks Emily for the question. Thanks Zach for an awesome answer. Uh, Suzanne has had, her, has had her hand up for a while. So Suzanne, please feel free to unmute and turn on your camera to ask your question. Hello, uh, I'm not able to start my video because the host has stopped it. Um, you can try again now that maybe it should work. There you go. I think it works now. Thank you so much. I'm Susanne from the Danish Lichen Sclerosis Organization. It's a small organization. Uh, it's a disease covered with great taboo. And uh, we would like to raise uh, awareness of uh, this disease, uh, but we are not sure how to approach it. Uh, we want to do the campaign to reach uh, a lot of undiagnosed or misdiagnosed people outside uh, uh, our organization. Uh, they probably have the disease uh, without even uh, know it themselves. So, but we're not sure how to uh, to begin this campaign uh, because it's, uh, as I said, uh, covered with a lot of uh, taboo to talk about this disease. So do you have any uh, good suggestions, uh, Zach, uh, to do such an awareness uh, campaign? Yeah, absolutely. So again, probably lots of things to think about that I can't answer all of, but where my mind goes at first is, when you say we want to raise awareness, the first thing I, I like to, to I, I always like to take big things and make them more precise and smaller. And so I say awareness of what? And it might be we want to raise awareness that we exist as an organization. It might be we want to raise awareness that this disease exists. But even if it's the latter, I would suggest that you get even more refined. And so let's not say raise awareness that it exists. It might be, let's raise awareness that it exists and presents a specific mental health burden to individuals, or it exists and a big percentage of the population may have it and not even know. Whatever it is, really focus on how precise and small you can make that individual message. And then your awareness campaign can focus on that one message. If it works, Maybe people visit your website and they give you their email address. Now you can have those big, long conversations that are more complex and nuanced. Start with something really precise and really singular. And then the next thing I would do is I heard you say, we want to raise awareness amongst the general population. I like to think of general population as a bad word. Get more precise. Eventually we can work on the entire population. Let's start by saying which singular one audience will we be most successful at? Is it people who are friends with individuals who are who, with patients? Is it we want to reach teachers so that they can start to identify things in classrooms? Is it is it, what can we do to make that audience more specific? So the two things I would start with is we want to raise awareness, but of what? And then once you answer that, make it smaller and more precise. And we want to raise awareness amongst a certain audience. And then once you define that, make it smaller and more precise. And then you can make the messaging more resonant. You might be able to say, hey, teachers, we want to raise awareness of dot, dot, dot. And so it feels very focused. People will connect with it more and you're more likely to be successful. Thank cool. you so much. It's really helpful. Okay, awesome. Great. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear that. Thanks so much, Suzanne, for an awesome question. I think lots of other patient leaders have heard in the same boat. Um, Brindley, you had one question in the chat, and I'm sure Zach would be happy to answer it. I'm also happy to, to ask the question, <laughs> or if you're there, you can go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so my question is, we are a smaller organization. Um, so how does that work? Do you do like consults with people to kind of help get a an idea of what the cost would be? Um, or what does that look like? Just because I know for us, you know, and I'm sure for most of the other smaller organizations, cost is a huge factor. Sure. Um, and, you know, your return on investment may not necessarily be monetary. So figuring out kind of what to do uh, uh, with that is difficult. So how do you guys handle that? Yeah, for sure. So um, because we only work with nonprofits, uh, we want, we know how thin those margins are and also how important return on investment is. So we don't proceed into big or deeper relationships with organizations unless we're certain that we can deliver value. That being said, we always are open to having initial conversations, giving advice, really starting to understand together, is this the right fit for a project um, together? If not, we often point uh, organizations that we're working with towards existing resources or templates, um, give some advice on how they might want to um, fit their plan to their capacity. Um, sometimes we're even connecting individuals with other individuals who might be able to help. Um, but the one sentence I say more than probably any sentence, I said it I think once in this presentation, is that the right strategy is the one you actually have the resources and capacity to pull off. And so the very first thing we do is we work with organizations in conversation one to say, how many hours per week do you have to pull this off? Do you have staff dedicated to this, volunteers dedicated to this, technology, do you have an agency or freelancer network? What do you have and what do you not have? Now let's decide what is possible with that. And in that list, it might be, we have a budget for uh, a team like principals. And if the answer is we don't, but we have other things, then we might be the right fit or we might not, but we're always open to having initial conversations and then just helping decide whether or not we are part of that solution or not. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Brinley. We have, uh, I think the last question for, for today is a question from Laura. Laura, I think you're, you should be able to unmute now. If you're, are you there? If not, I can go ahead and ask Laura's question. So she says, I represent the Romanian Association for Allergy Education. Oh, yes, we can't hear you, Laura, but I'll go ahead and ask the question. Can you please share an example of a successful digital advocacy campaign engaging youth um, and campaigns effective on newer social media channels like TikTok? Yeah. So youth, absolutely. I have, we, we've worked with organizations. Um, so actually in Canada, the Planned Parenthood example that I shared, um, Planned Parenthood in Canada in Toronto, Planned Parenthood Toronto, our client is a youth focused organization. So the mandate of Planned Parenthood is a little bit different depending on which country you're in and which region you're in. So that's a youth specific organization. Um, and we focus on with them working with uh, their community, running digital campaigns that help collect content, collect stories, collect um, short form video content that we can then share with the world. Um, I'm trying to, we, we generally um, work with kind of audiences of youth that are 18 plus only because we tend to be in the advertising space a little bit more. Um, and when it comes to some of the platforms we're working with, we can be limited to targeting individuals under the age of 18. Um, so the youth that I'm thinking about are maybe youth over the age of 18, if we're saying, will you sign the petition, et cetera. Otherwise, our campaigns uh, that engage youth might be focusing on helping to collect stories, testimonials, uh, videos that we can then use and amplify as part of our campaign. Um, TikTok, TikTok is something that's changing very much every single day, even in the last couple of days uh, over here. Um, we, I will be transparent, have not run. I have, I have advised my clients uh, to stay away from TikTok, not as a an overall, like all clients should stay away from TikTok, but I've yet to have a strategy presented to me where TikTok was the answer or was the recommended um, next step. We mostly work with clients who are based in North America. We do have some global organizations that we work with. And most of our clients, even if we're working on a digital advocacy campaign, are also focused on reaching people to eventually fundraise. And we know that our average donor in Canada and, and the United States is 
more responsive on Facebook um, and is of a different demographic than um, kind of than those who are on TikTok. And so we just, you know, to be transparent, haven't specialized in that channel yet. Um, we are almost always working with organizations who don't have enough budget to be on every single channel. And so we need to make some decisions and it has yet to be um, the one where we think we will get the most results. Not to say it's not the right pick for certain organizations or campaigns, but um, I can speak to youth and have a little bit. I can't speak to TikTok with as much uh, with as much expertise. Thanks so much, Zach, for all your insights. Um, I think we're at the end of the, the day um, today. But I would like to thank you so much for um, your presentation, for sharing your expertise, for teaching us all about digital advocacy and the importance and strategies for us to, to be able to advocate for our communities. Um, I know that there's some more questions coming in here already. Um, so Suzanne does have a question, but uh, maybe I can connect you via email to answer that question if that's okay. And um, I'd like to say thank you. I'll, I'll send the recording over and I hope everyone has a really wonderful day or evening or morning wherever you are in the world. So thank you all for joining us. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And thank you for all the amazing work that you folks are doing. Thanks, everyone. Have a good okay. day. Bye.